And one of the things that's interesting is when we're at meetings, it's very interesting. All of us have a pad out and we're writing stuff down. Still, still stealing stuff from other people, you know? And because you gotta be learning, you know? I mean, I don't have to agree with it, but I need to at least reflect on it and see if it fits into what I'm trying to do. Dr. Revisa. All right. Josiah, how you doing, man? I'm doing great. How are you doing on this uh, on this fine Tuesday Tuesday afternoon morning? I'm doing great. It's nice to be with you, Josiah, in doing this and talking to the people out there. Hopefully they're going to get something out of the time they take to listen to this. Yeah, I don't see how they can. It's it, it's uh, it's an honor, and we uh, we want to say thank you. Dr. Aviza is a retired professor of applied sports psychology at the Cal State Fullerton. Um, he's also worked with the United States softball, field hockey teams, equestrian, water polo, uh, and, of course, baseball. Aviza has also worked with uh, the Dutch, Italian, Czech, Spanish, and German national baseball and softball organizations. He's worked with the Jets the Los Angeles Angels of Anaheim, the, the Dodgers, the Cubs, Galaxy, the Argonauts of Toronto, and countless others. Dr. Revisa, welcome. Boy, you got all the background checked there, man. <laughs> Unbelievable. I'm just getting tired just listening to you. Oh, man, I need a table of contents, man. Body of work is, is strong. I'll tell you one thing up front, Josiah. I've had the privilege to learn from a lot of great coaches and a lot of athletes. And... I thank all of them for the experiences that they shared with me that helped me in doing my work so that I can bring it to other athletes and other sports psych people or people working in this area. And the beautiful thing, Josiah, that I've really seen over the years that's, um, that's really been impressive for me has been the number of athletes that maybe I worked with 20 years ago. And when I see them and they tell me, Ken, I'm still using that stuff you talked about. Mm -hmm. I'm using it in my life now. And um, that really makes me feel good because that's what this is about. These aren't just sports psych skills. These are life skills that we can use throughout our life. No question. Absolutely. And I think, uh, I think what you said is, uh, is very potent in that that's the greatest compliment someone can give you is that, hey, all those things that you taught me back in the day, I'm using them in life and it's making a difference. So kudos to you because you've made a big impact on a lot of people. Yeah, thank you. Uh, you're up to some big time things and you're about to unleash something pretty big in the world of sports. Would you love to tell us about it today? Uh, I think what you're talking about, Josiah, is, is after four years, Tom Hansen and I, finally updated our book, Heads Up Baseball. We call this one Heads Up Baseball 2. And uh, mm -hmm. it took us, we thought we were going to bang it out in a year. It ended up taking us four years, but it came out great. And um, it really addresses where I am at with the method team at this time. Um, and the emphasis of the book, I would say if I could summarize it, in one sentence is you got to give a hundred percent of what you got to win the next pitch because you're not always going to feel great, but you have to use whatever you got to just really focus on taking care of that next pitch. And that's something in the middle of writing this book, Tom Hansen, the co-author, um, he said to me, Ken, if you had to summarize the book in one sentence, how would you summarize it? And that's what I came up with, and I still feel that way. Because in this day and age, you've got to teach young people how to compete and how to learn to feel comfortable being uncomfortable and how to grind. Um, that's part of it. And with this book, what we're excited about is we're self-publishing it, and if anyone's interested, they need to go to headsupbaseball2.com. That's headsupbaseball2, the number two, dot com. And they can purchase it there. Thanks for letting me plug the book, Josiah. Thank you. Yo, no doubt, no doubt. I know that the, that first book that you uh, that you guys came out with, 
was was a big hitter. I know a lot of us use it within this organization. I've used it. I've read it. I've listened to it audibly. Uh, and it's and it's just chocked full of uh, of great information. And for those of you who didn't catch it, this is not available on Amazon, correct? This is this is through your website, right? That's the new one is through our website at this time. Maybe later we'll do it through Amazon, but at this time we're doing it through our website. And it's got a lot of um, the forward is by Joe Madden. I have two people that did the forward: Joe Madden and Mike Sosha. Uh, because I worked with both of the teams, and the vast majority of athletes that we quote in the book are athletes that I worked with. And um, every quote that's in the book, the athletes looked at, and they approved of the quotes. So um, I really feel good about it, Josiah. That's great. So this is this is straight, coming straight from the horse's mouth. So yeah, we'll, we'll definitely be getting our hands on, on, on some copies and, uh, and putting it to putting it to you. So I want to get right down into it today, uh, Dr. Revis. Okay. In your opinion, when we get right down to the, to the brass tacks, in your opinion, what is the most prevalent performance issue that you have dealt with in dealing with professional athletes? I think the biggest thing when you ask me that question without thinking, the first thing I go to is um, perfectionism. I find with Olympic athletes and professional athletes, the perfectionism, um, they're so hard on themselves. They're so driven. Um, and it's that perfectionism that is a true motivator. I mean, it's very positive uh, because it makes you work hard, makes you do the extra stuff. But if you overplay that strength, it becomes a weakness. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times what you have to do is curb it because if you overplay it, there's that monkey on the back all the time telling you you're doing something wrong. And there comes a point where you got to let that go and you got to just immerse yourself in what you're doing. So for me, it's perfectionism is the first thing that jumps out at me. Okay. And what are some, with that said, what are some simple tools or simple uh, points of of wisdom that you would give an athlete that is a, is an unhealthy perfectionist? I think number one is just like I said, to understand that it's a strength. It's not, it's not only many people view it as a weakness. It's not, it's a strength as well, but we have to learn to use it to our advantage and not overplay it. Second thing with perfectionism, you tend to see things as they're great or they're bad. And, what I've developed over the years is I've developed two things. One is what I call the Ken Revisa bathtub test for perfection. And that's where I, I fill a bathtub up with an inch of water. And I ask the athlete to stand on the surface of the water. If they're able to stand on the surface of the water, um, then they're expected to be perfect. But if they touch porcelain, they're a human being, <laughs> and they're allowed to make some mistakes. I also try that out every time I go swimming in the pool. <laughs> but so far, it's not working too well. But, but the thing that's key on it is the athlete starts laughing a little bit about it, and I think that laughter is huge. Yeah. The second thing, besides the bathtub test, would be that the perfectionist like I mentioned, sees things as great or bad, either or, that I've developed the Ken Revisa degree of crappiness scale. So how, how bad was the performance? Was it a little crappy? Was it medium crappy? Was it really crappy? Um, and that sounds like a negative, to put it in negative terms, but perfectionists can think in those negative terms. And if you start talking about everything being positive, sometimes they won't follow. But if you can keep it in less crappy terms, they can relate to it and grab on. And eventually you can move them in that positive direction. But they start seeing the gradations of it. Those are two things, that, well, three things that really help me in working with the perfectionism stuff. That's good. That's that's some good information right there. I want you to, you know, you've dealt with, you know, you know, people at the literally at the peak of their sport, Olympic athletes, uh, major league players, NFL players, 
uh, and others who are at the pinnacle. Um, my next question to you is, I want you to freely talk about the mental game versus the physical game. There are, are there are athletes who undoubtedly are playing professional sports right now who do not have a mental routine, who do, who do not have um, necessarily goals as far as a, a framework or a blueprint for their success. They are just killing people and just mopping the floor because of their talent. I want you to talk about the mental game versus the physical game and why it's so important to have one. Um, first thing I'd like to say is when you talk about Olympic professional athletes, one thing that I've learned over my years of doing this is we put these people on a pinnacle. We put them on this, that they're something special and they have a special skill, but they're also human beings. Mm -hmm. And one thing I've learned is confidence can be fragile. Um, it comes and it goes, it ebbs and it flows. I mean, I'm dealing with baseball where you have 162 games. I mean, it is a grind. You're not going to feel great all the time. It was like last year on November 3rd um, with the Cubs when we won the World Series. This spring training, I asked the players uh, when we had our first meeting, I said on November 3rd when we played that final game in Cleveland, how many people felt great and not one hand went up? How many people felt good? Not many hands went up. Their bodies were beat up. They were drained. But how many people were ready to compete and every hand went up? So this feeling good idea is definitely overrated. And that ties right into your question about why the athletes need to, at some level, start learning the mental side of the game so that they have something to go to when the garbage hits the fan. And the given thing is the garbage is eventually going to hit the fan and you need to have something to go to that helps you get it back in track. You know, as someone as yourself, Dr. Revisa, who's, who's seen many generations of athletes, you know, we're, we're, we're doing this podcast in 2017. So this is the year. You know, how does this generation of young players, of professionals, rank in terms of its fortitude? Are the athletes tougher? Are they weaker? Are they more sensitive? Are they more politically correct? Are they more informed? What are your thoughts on that? My thoughts on that, and I also saw it in my, my 40 years of being a university professor to see where, how the students evolved and where they're at in this IY generation and just dealing with um, the technology that they're dealing with and the amount of bombardment of information, it's overwhelming. Social media and what athletes are dealing with today versus 15 years ago is incredible. At whatever age, not just the high-level athletes, mm -hmm. I mean, even high school. Mm -hmm. I mean, college athletes that have followers and their tweets of like 20,000 followers yeah. for a college athlete. I mean, that's a lot of stuff people are dealing with, but that's the world young people are in. But the big thing that I see is this, this instant gratification um, is a hard thing because in, in the young generation, they want everything quick and fast. And one of the things is athletic performance is what I would call analog in a digital world. You can't do any shortcuts. It's the old system of you have to do an apprenticeship, you have to become a craftsman, you have to become a master craftsman. You have to learn your craft, you have to go through the progressions, and most importantly, you have to go through the failures and the learning that comes with the pursuit of excellence. And I think sometimes that's hard for the younger generation because they come from, they grew up with parents that were doing everything they could so everything would be smooth for their children, taking care of their children. But when you go in the competitive arena, it's not smooth, it's not graceful, it's a battle. It's constant compensating and adjusting. 
And that gets back to like in the new book, Heads Up Baseball, too, where we're talking about we got to talk to athletes what it means to compete yes. in this day and age. Many of them grew up in the world of showcasing, and they really didn't learn how to compete. They learned to show off their skills. Um, so that's a whole different thing than the grind that goes with sport um, that sometimes can be difficult for the athlete of today. I know I'm rambling and going all over the place, Josiah, but you really hit a sensitive note because the other thing that goes with the athlete of today, and it ties into the travel ball world many of them came up with, is the whole issue of being on a team and what being on a team means. It's almost like we have to approach being on a team as a skill in this day and age because. They're on so many teams and so many teams where they're just showcasing that they really don't know what it means to be on a team and pick up a teammate. And that that becomes a skill that they have to learn as they get older. Yeah, no, you hit you you hit on some very um, ardent points. You know, I think what you said regarding the old school mentality and, and doing things. Uh, the old school way and and the competitive arena not being easy, not being smooth. If that's the truth, which it is, why would we train otherwise? You know, and I think what you what you said is very important. Uh, and, and you also said something that could be literally another podcast in and of itself when you talked about apprenticeship. Would you would you illuminate more on on that concept of apprenticeship? Because I think that um, it, it's a lost art, particularly in the West. Uh, in, in our society, could you illuminate? Yeah, that's the whole issue, I think, of of preparation and paying your dues and performing and pushing yourself where failure is part of the learning process. And, and it was one of the themes in Heads Up Baseball 1 20 years ago that we talked about the failure is positive feedback that you have to learn from your failure. You have to get the lessons learned, the teachings out of what happened to you in that performance. And sometimes it's as the philosopher Aldous Huxley said, it's not what you experience, but it's how you experience what you experience. (laughs) Meaning when you reflect on it, when you get the information from what happened to you. And this ties into something when I work with athletes to take two hours out of your life and practice and train is great. But the issue is, what did you learn from it besides just two hours of work? How did you get better? What did you learn about yourself? What did you learn about your teammates? What did you learn about your sport? Um, And being able to, in some cases, I encourage athletes to keep a journal and write some of this stuff down or punch it into your computer and have a log where you're not just doing all the physical training in your log, but you're also getting into some of this mental game stuff so you can get the apprentice stuff of the lessons learned and you keep getting better at what you're doing. Sometimes we fail, but the failure can be a wonderful teacher. Dr. Revisa, you've taught so many people, you know, not only on the field, but in the classroom and in life. Who has been your greatest teacher or who have been your greatest teachers? Oh, great question. Uh, I have, oh, I haven't been asked that in a while. I have some of my coaches from high school that really influenced me. I played football in high school and college and my High school coach was a real influence in terms of discipline, work ethic, that type of stuff. Uh, When I went to graduate school, I had a professor by the name of Dr. Eleanor Matheny, and she was just, at that time, she was at the end of her teaching career. She was probably in her mid-60s at the time. And, man, I would go to her classes in sport philosophy and why people play and what's the nature of sport and games and play, then I would be mesmerized. And I still remember when I went to graduate school at the University of Southern California and sat in her class 
our first assignment, Josiah, was to get a lemon, and we had to go home and spend 10 minutes just sitting with the lemon, <laughs> watching the lemon to observe what we saw. <laughs> no music, no TV, and just totally look at a lemon. And that experience really impacted me because it's what I've been doing ever since in the field of sports psychology is just looking at the sport experience and trying to see it with a fresh pair of eyes. Um, and even at this stage of my career, one of the things I do when I'm around teams is sometimes I want to help so much. I get into my agenda and what I want to do for them versus letting their experience show itself to me, which means I need to sit back, take a breath, center myself a little bit, get my spine straight, open my heart, and let that experience come into me versus me going out to it. Um, I don't know if that makes sense. Oh, yeah. But that's what I'm doing at this stage of the career. Um, so that would be one of the things. Eleanor Matheny really influenced me. And another person was um, a yoga teacher I had when I was a graduate student. Um, I took a yoga class from her, and she really helped introduce me to myself and my body and taught me more about awareness than anyone else. And after that, it was just um, <clears throat> all the coaches that impacted me. Um, Augie Garrido, Dave Snow, uh, Joe Madden, Marcel Latchman. I mean, major league coaches, college coaches. I've just been so fortunate, Josiah. Wow. And you do need mentors. You do need teachers. Yes. Um, and for the young people out there listening to this, you never know when your teacher is going to appear or what form they're going to be in. But the teacher will appear when you need them. I, I, want, to, I want to flip the script but stay on task. And what I mean by that is you just, you just told us about some very key people in your life. And a lot of times people like yourself, I know this you know, for a fact that you don't like bragging about yourself. Uh, that's for other people to do. But you are extremely good at what you do. And what I want you to do for even 20 seconds, I want you to tell us, uh, you know, tell the, the sporting community, uh, based on what you've told us about your, your mentors, why are you so good at what you do? Why is your style effective with your specific uh, fingerprint, if you will? Um, that's a good question. Um, I think that the key thing you said is it's my style. And my style is not for everyone. Um, my style is for me, and people have to figure out what their style is, and they have to bring themselves to their dance. Mm -hmm. And that's what becomes important. You can't be Ken Revisi. You can't be this person. You have to be yourself, and you have to spend the time and the personal reflection in figuring out what that is and who you are. And you also have to be real clear, Josiah, on what you know and what you don't know. Yes. And as a consultant, what you can do and what you're not qualified to do. Mm -hmm. And that's part of knowing yourself. So uh, for me, uh, I have my things that I go through, but people need to go on their journey and figure out their things for themselves. One of your themes has been one pitch at a time. Uh, and I remember when I was in college, that was actually our theme uh, at Arizona State under the late Bruce Snyder. He preached one at a time, one at a time. And I, uh, you know, I think it was last year you told me that you're actually the one who consulted with Arizona State University and, and came up with that with that saying. I want you to tell the audience what, what your the, the underlying theme of what one pitch at a time means. Well, it's that same theme, whatever the sport is. Uh, in the case of ASU at that time, um, it was ASU football. 
and the whole issue was one play at a time. And that was something that Bruce Snyder and I resonated with. And it was something I would say that all of the coaches that I've really had a connection with, that's been part of the, the core belief, the foundation, is you've got to take care of managing the moment and you've got to keep the process greater than the outcome. And the process is in the moment. And I know this is something with Joe Madden and Joe and I started together with the Angels and then the Rays and now the Cubs. I mean, it's like last year when we won it all, Joe only talked about winning it all one time. And that was in spring training at the very beginning where he said his goal for the year was to win the last game played in Major League Baseball. And after that, it was all about the process. And it was about managing the moment. And it was about today, today, today. Yes. Uh, in baseball terms, it's day by day, game by game, inning by inning, pitch by pitch, side by side. Um, you do it together. You do it with your teammates. Because the idea of being present is contagious just like anxiety is contagious mm -hmm. being in the moment can be contagious too um and i really found that that if we just take care of giving a hundred percent of what we got to win the next thing we're trying to do that's all we can do don't worry about the outcome of the total experience just take care of where you're at the time is now, the place is here. And as you do it, you're in control of yourself. You have a plan. You commit to that plan. And then you trust your stuff or you just compete with what you got. Yes. And those three things, self-control, plan, trust, become critical pillars to going one pitch, one play, one possession at a time. Managing the moment, how big is that? You know, and the process is is greater than the outcome. I think those are just really great reminders. And I think one of the things that was most powerful about what you just said that stuck out to me is being in the moment is contagious. You know, and uh, yeah, I mean that's that you know that's powerful. And and those that know you know that you're very close to to Joe Madden, um, and what you guys did last year with the Cubs, you know, rippled through the world of sports. You know, talk to us really br briefly about the energy and was there one specific message that you had or that you tried to make sticky um, towards that organization during your time there? I don't think it was my message. I think it was Joe Madden's message of keep the pleasure of competition greater than the pressure and, you know, do simple better. Those were the two themes that just resonated for the young group of players and the players really embraced them. And they came from Joe in terms of his approach and working with the guys, because the issue of being in the moment sounds so simple, Josiah, but it's hard to do when the garbage is hitting the fan. That's the thing, you know, it gets back to what we started with confidence is fragile. When I have all my confidence, I can manage the moment, no problem. But the issue is when my confidence isn't there, how do I manage the moment? How do I get it done when I have my B game and my C game? That becomes the key to consistency. Mm -hmm. It isn't about being in the zone. I personally think being in the zone is overrated. I tell athletes all the time, you're not that crappy. You have to be in the zone to perform well. Okay. Mm -hmm. You've got to get it done and you've got to manage the moments and just take care of what's happening right here, right now. So with your listeners, if I were to ask them this question, can you really listen to me for the next 20 seconds? So what that's going to mean is you need to just shut down all the technology around you. And I need you just really to just close your eyes and really hear what I'm saying for 20 seconds. Okay. Ready, 
set, go. For a short period of time, we can do anything we want with our attention. Right now, you're really listening with your ears. You're hearing everything I'm saying. Your focus is different now than it was seven seconds ago. This is what I'm talking about with being in the moment. You've got to develop a system that gets you right here, right now, and gets you in charge of managing the moment like you are now. Okay, that's 20 seconds. Let it go. Oh, okay. Yeah, we can't go on for hours like that, but for short periods of time, yeah, we got to lock it in and we got to get into that moment. And it's a skill and it's not easy. Yeah. That's what I got on that, Josiah. Oh. You know, concentrated bouts of focus energy. That that is uh that that's really good stuff, Dr. Revisa. You know, you've you've worked with a lot of Hall of Famers and arguably a lot of future Hall of Famers. What do they all have in common? What is a common thread that you've seen in some of the world's best? I think there's two things to look at the world's best for our listening audience, especially the athletes. Don't focus so much on the world's best and what these high-level performers do. I think that, that gets us into a mindset of, well, that's what they do, and then there's me. And I think one of the things people need to do at times is look at their own really good performances mm -hmm. and see what they're doing. Yes. When you're performing well, what's the best you you can be instead of what is it that LeBron James does? You know, what is it that this guy does? I mean, no, look at yourself. What do you do when it's really going well? What's your script? What's your system? Um yeah, we can learn things from other top performers, no question. But most importantly, learn from our own experience when we're going well and what we do. Because that's where I'm sure you have preparation, you have a routine that you're going through. I'm, I'm sure you're committed to the task. I'm, I mean, you're doing those things and you're locked in and you're engaged in what you're doing. And I think we get too concerned what other great performers are doing versus what we do. These are just points that, man, it's just like the more you can get it in you um, and, and remember them, the, the more they're going to serve you when you really need them. So I, I really appreciate uh, the insight. You know, when it comes to sport and performance psychology, you know, what is broken and how can we fix it? I don't know what you mean by the question, Josiah. So, so a lot of times, a lot of times, when athletes think of psychologists or psychology consultants or mental skills coaches and things like that, there's a mm. huge, there's a huge disconnect in which the athletes like, man, I'm I'm good, you know what I'm saying? I don't, I don't, you know, I don't, I don't need uh, no voodoo, no gurus telling me anything right now. You know, I'll figure, right. I'll figure right. it out by myself. So, what I okay. want to know is in in your uh, wealth of knowledge and experience are there any areas that are broken and how do we fix it how do we reconcile it well i think it depends on the athlete you can talk all you want to the athlete but until he or she is ready to address the issue you're not going to have much impact but the other thing that's very important here is this isn't a matter of it's broken we're going to fix it this is a matter of what does it take to be really good at what you do? Mm -hmm. And you ask, you ask any athlete at whatever level, how much of your game is physical and how much of your game is mental? And they may say it's 50-50. And then the question becomes, well, how much time do you spend on your mental game? Um, and, and that's the other variable that uh, comes into play. And I think from a coaching perspective and from a sports psych perspective, you've got to get the people you work with to buy into the importance of the mental game. That it's not just talent, but the mental game comes into play. No question. I look at, I look at uh, a lot of, of your work and things that you've done, people that you've impacted. And, you know, at this point in your career as a retired professor, as, as a as a consultant who's worked with you know countless numbers of athletes, 
you know, what is what is one legacy filled, legacy laced uh, statement that you would give to the next generation? What would you give them as a gift? Like, you know what, guys, this is what you really need to hear in the world of sports. Truly know what you know and know what you don't know. And know that you can't do everything. A lot of young people think they know everything. Mm -hmm. And that can get in your way. You need to stay in touch with that you can always get better at what you're doing. And learn your craft more and more. Because everything we're asking the athlete to do in terms of performance, the consultant needs to be doing that in his or her development as a consultant. No question. Wow. And you would probably even argue the same thing for coaches, right? The coaches who are in charge of the athletic experience, the same thing, right? Exactly. I mean, so you coach a game. What did you learn? How'd you get better from it? I mean, I know for me to this day, when I'm either driving home or flying back from working with a team, I'm asking myself, what did I learn? How can I get, how did I get better from that? Mm -hmm. And, and sometimes it's not new things that you learn, but it's just a different way that you learn them. And that's okay too, you know? Yeah. And I figured, Josiah, when I'm done learning and done get better, it's going to be time for me to stop doing the work. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. Yeah. Because, hey, we're working with people to try to have them get better. And if we're not getting better ourselves, um, it's like for me, my initial research was on peak experiences in sport way back in the day. Uh, this was back when uh, the zone wasn't even known mm -hmm. and flow states <laughs> and all of that. And mm -hmm. I did these studies on peak experiences when athletes were at their greatest. And then I kept trying to get everyone into the zone. We got to get into this zone, this magical zone of high level performance. <laughs> and then about 15 years ago, I finally started to hear what the coaches were telling me. And that is, we're not going to be in the zone all the time, Ken. Peak performance is about compensating and adjusting. So basically I had to take a step back and, and, refute some of my earlier thoughts and i think i do a better job today in what i'm doing with the approach that i'm taking now at the same time that i say that josiah when i was doing the other stuff i was given the best i had and that's all we can do is give the best we have and that's knowing the research going out doing the work practicing working on yourself not just working with athletes and other people, but working on yourself. No doubt. And looking at your frailties and looking at your strengths mm -hmm. and developing those. I mean, that's very insightful. What you just said is, is so insightful and it's very encouraging, you know, coming from somebody who was a trailblazer, you know, in the, in this, uh, in this field. And if the trailblazer, if the, one of the forefathers in our you know, in our profession can say that, you know what, I'm going to continue learning. I'm going to continue getting better. I'm going to continue improving. Then that leaves no room for excuse for anybody else. So I really appreciate that because that's very uh, telling and it's very insightful on, on, on how we can all get better. And one of the things when you say that about uh, forefathers and uh, all of that, um, I, I'm very humbled by it. But there's a whole group of people, um, my generation of Terry Orlick, Keith Henschen, Gloria Belagay, um, so many other people, Rich Gordon, Dave Duke. I mean, there's so many people. And one of the things that's interesting is when we're at meetings, it's very interesting. All of us have a pad out and we're writing stuff down. Yes. Still. Still. Stealing stuff from other people, <laughs> you know, and because you got to be learning. Absolutely. You know? I mean, I don't have to agree with it, but I need to at least reflect on it and see if it fits into what I'm trying to do.
as we close, uh, you know, the whole premise of this uh, podcast is melting point. And, you know, the melting point of gold is 1,947 degrees in order to burn out the impurities, the dross, the other elements that don't need to be in there to make something that is, you know, tried, something that is that will last, something that is of high value. What was that melting point in your life as a professional? I don't know whether it was as a student, uh, as a young man in which, you know, you had a serious choice to make. I can either go right, I can go left, I can get run over, I can quit, I can do something else. I can go be a car salesman. What was what was that point in your life? And- I think the point came for me when I was 25 years old. I finished my Ph.D. Uh, from USC. And I was teaching at the State University in New York. It was my first semester, and I was trying to be like all the other professors. And there was a point where I wasn't enjoying it. It wasn't working for me. I was ready to leave university teaching. And I came to a point where I realized that Uh, Matter of fact, I think it was a Neil Young song about Be Yourself. And to really hear the lyrics of that song, and it was at that point that I stopped trying to be like everyone else, and I started to just focus on being myself. And that was the turning point for me that was critical. And then there have been other things along the way. Definitely. But that when you ask me that question, that's the first thing that jumps out um, as you ask the question. Wow. Yeah, and that, that's uh, and we're all glad. We're all glad that you, you did. So we, we say thank you. OK, you got it, man. And uh, thank everyone for listening. And hopefully you got something out of it. Dr. Viz, I appreciate your time. You have a great rest of your day. You too. And uh, we'll talk more later. Okay.